Hello, I'm Georgina Jalbo from Lexus PSL Private Client and I'm joined today by Adam Carvalho, an associate in the Contentious Trusts and Probate team at Farrow & Co. And Adam is going to talk to us today about the case of Banks and Goodfellow and its continued relevance in light of the Mental Capacity Act 2005. So thanks for coming in today, Adam. Um, I understand that you've been talking to various intermediaries about this case and others uh, in relation to your firm's capacity initiative. Um, I expect our listeners will be very familiar with the test for testamentary capacity set out in the case of Banks and Goodfellow, but they are perhaps less familiar with the facts of and the background to the case, which I understand are actually very interesting. So um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, sure. It's Banks and Goodfellow is obviously quite an old case. It dates back to 1870, but it does give quite a lively illustration of a, a challenge to a will on the basis of lack of capacity. Um, so I'm going to take you back to the 1860s, which was um, a, a turbulent uh, decade in, in, in world history. You had the uh, American Civil War, uh, the Austro-Prussian War, Italian unification, um, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that Cumbria wasn't at the centre of all of that excitement. But in fact, it was obviously the, the setting for Banks and Goodfellow, which, which still holds good today, um, as we'll see later on. Um, and so John Banks was the testator, the person who made the will in this case. Uh, and he was born in 1811. He was the son of a, a pencil manufacturer in Keswick. And after his father and mother's deaths, uh, he inherited quite a, a significant estate with a number of cottages um, in and around Keswick which were of quite significant value and produced quite a healthy rent on which he lived. Um, and he seems to have had mental health issues throughout his life. When he was 29, he was admitted to a, a lunatic asylum with the rather general sounding diagnosis of um, general insanity. Um, and there's quite a good article on the background of this case by Professor um, Robin Jacobi and Martin Frost. And, and in that they give uh, some quite interesting, um, uh, uh, quite an interesting sort of run through of some evidence from John's landlady who, who talked about the um, various symptoms that he was having and, and what he was saying at the time. And, and she talked about how one night he pulled out the fire grate um, and he was convinced that he was going up there to catch the devil. Uh, and then later on he said that he'd been killing the devil with a cream jug. Um, and so um, it's quite clear that he had these quite bad mental health um, issues, but he still managed to um, carry out day-to-day -day business. And when he was 50, he called for his solicitor, who was a man called Mr. Ansel, who was from Keswick. Um, and it was, we know, December. Um, it was quite a long 20-mile trip from Keswick to the, the small hamlet where John lived. Um, and we're told in the judgment that the roads were of a very bad quality uh, and that there were heavy gale force winds and snows. Um, and I've always thought that Mr Ansel must have been slightly disappointed because he got to uh, John Banks and he was told that all that John wanted was a very, very simple will. He just wanted to leave everything to his niece, who was called Margaret. Um, so Mr Ansel returned to Keswick, drew up all in those terms uh, and the will was then executed by, by John slightly after Christmas. Um, and a year later, John had died of um, epilepsy and insanity. And rather sadly then, Margaret um, died a, a very short while later, um, who you'll remember was going to inherit his estate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she was aged just 20 and died of, of consumption. And so Margaret's heir uh, under the intestacy rules was a man called Edward Goodfellow. Uh, and he was completely unrelated to the, to the Banks family. Um, and so sort of pausing there for a second, um, this is a not unusual setting for a will dispute because you've got uh, very obvious questions about the, the validity of the will, um, quite a significant estate, and obviously um, a, a feeling perhaps on the part of the Banks family that family wealth has has passed outside the family. And so perhaps not, not unpredictably, um, John's half-brother brought forward a, a challenge to the will. Right. 
Um, and I understand there are some interesting aspects of the judgment that are worth highlighting as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the case went to, to first instance trial in the late 1860s, and then it went to the, to the Court of Appeal in 1870. And the, the leading judgment was given by Chief Justice Coburn. And Coburn himself had had a history with um, sort of the, 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 the interaction between um, mental health issues and the law because he defended uh, the murderer of Prime, Minister's, Prime Minister Peel's um, private secretary and he'd actually been um, quite a key part in formulating the, the, the defence of insanity. Um, and there were two interesting aspects f for me to his, to his judgement. The first one was that he, he looked at the key difference between the English system of law in relation to inheritance and a number of other systems in the continent and, and the Middle East. And, and that difference is that over here, obviously, we have complete freedom as to how we, we're going to deal with our estates after death. So um, you and I can leave our estates to whichever dog or cat's home we choose. And there are obvious perils to that, but, but um, Coburn felt that essentially an Englishman can be trusted to do the right thing. And he said that our natural instincts and affections will, will, will lead to us making proper provision for our, our nearest and dearest. And he said, I, I, um, sort of in quite high Victorian language, he said, there's a reasonable and well-warranted expectation uh, on the part of a man's kindred that on his death his effects will become theirs instead of being given to strangers and to dis disappoint this expectation and, and disregard the claims of kindred to the inheritance is to shock the common sentiments of mankind and violate what all men concur in deeming an obligation of the moral law. So, <laughs> so he, 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 he put it in quite serious terms. But um, if the English court's going to, to deal with the very important matter of inheritance in that way and in a sense leave it up to the, to the general public, then they have to be sure, obviously, that only valid wills are admitted to probate. Mm -hmm. and, and the question was, how do you do that with a person suffering from uh, insane delusions? And that brings me on to the second, interesting to me anyway, um, aspect, which was there was um, a view at the time that the mind was, um, to use Coben's phrase, one and indivisible. And therefore, if there was a, an unsoundness in part of the mind, that would make a person absolutely incapable of, of making a valid will, sort of like having um, a body of water that you drop some poison into and that taints, taints the whole of the water. But, but Coben didn't agree and he said that in the case of someone suffering from insane delusions, they're capable of having lucid periods within a general pattern of, of insanity. And he surveyed all of the laws of, or he surveyed a lot of um, Commonwealth jurisdictions and their laws um, and, and findings on uh, capacity. And, and he formulated uh, what's become known as, as the law in Banks and Goodfellow. Um, and that is that a person has to understand three things or be capable of understanding three things to validly make a will. They have to understand the nature of the act of making a will. They have to understand the extent of the property of which they're disposing. And they have to understand the claims to which they ought to give effect. And it was in relation to that, to that latter, uh, understanding the claims to which they ought to give effect point, that he said that no disorder of the mind should poison the affections of, of the person making the will. So applying that, what he said was that, yes, John had these insane delusions, but at the time that he made the will, he was lucid. And, and even though the, the delusions were seen as uh, latent, as somehow kind of bubbling under, um, in fact, they didn't influence the way he made his will. And so the will was, was found to be valid. And so that, that was really the end of the case. Edward Goodfellow got an unexpected windfall and a rather fortuitous um, <coughs> inheritance. And obviously we, we got the, uh, the rule in Banks and Goodfellow. Yes, I know, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but of course, since Banks and Goodfellow, the Mental Capacity Act 2005 has introduced 
an arguably stricter test of mental capacity. And I think it's fair to say there's been some confusion amongst practitioners as to which test should now be applied when considering testamentary capacity. Um, can you explain to what extent the Banks and Goodfellow test is still relevant and in what circumstances the different tests should be applied? Well, there, there was <coughs> there's been a, a debate, I guess, since um, the, the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 because um, the MCA itself sets out um, a test for mental capacity um, which is decision specific um, and is in fact it's not dissimilar to the to the rule in Banks and Goodfellow but there's <coughs> quite a key difference in that under the Mental Capacity Act it's, it's assumed that a person has capacity uh, unless it's shown that that's not the case whereas under the old common rule um, approach co common law approach um, once you've shown that someone is suffering from a mental illness, the burden of, of showing <coughs> uh, that they uh, had testamentary capacity shifts to the person trying to prove um, the will. And the, the recent 2014 case of, of Walker and Badmin involved a, a testator who was suffering from a, a brain tumour. And um, Nicholas Strauss QC um, clarified that when you're looking at the validity of the will of a, a deceased person, Banks and Goodfellow remains uh, the correct test to apply. The Mental Capacity Act, he said, should only be applied uh, in relation to um, the capacity of, of living people. So for instance, if you're looking at making a statutory will, you would apply the, the MCA. And it has to be said that what we, what we really need is a, is, is, is a higher court ruling to, to um, clarify this, because there are um, various academic authorities and also other cases which suggest that the MCA is the correct test for um, testamentary capacity and also um, suggest uh, that in a way the MCA has um, kind of subsumed and, and, and uh, ta ta taken over from, from Banks and Goodfellow. Right. Um, well, yes, it does sound as if <laughs> yeah, we could definitely do with some more clarification. Um, is there any sort of legislative clarification on the horizon at all? Yeah, we, we have the um, Law, law um, Commission's review of the Law of Wills, which is um, being carried out at the moment, and I understand that the <coughs> report is, is not far away. So realistically, I think um, it's agreed that we're looking at probably five years or something before legislation would come in, but that they will be reporting on testamentary capacity, uh, on uh, rectification of wills, uh, will formalities, and the, the thorny uh, issue of mutual wills. So, so there should be some legislative uh, sort of tidying up uh, in the future. Right. Well, thank you very much. That was um, yeah, extremely interesting uh, to hear the, the facts behind the case of Banks and Goodfellow. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>